Hello, hello. Welcome again to the P2P Soapbox. I'm your host and P2P BFF, Marcy Maxwell. As I shared on our last episode, we just wrapped our annual P2P Professional Forum Conference last month, and we had an amazing slate of speakers. So amazing that over the next few episodes, we are going to be bringing some of the most in-demand topics and presenters from the conference to join me here on the pod. So get excited. We've spent a few episodes so far of this podcast talking about one of the core elements of peer-to-peer fundraising, relationship building and community. This is a business by far that is all about the people. And because two things can be true at the same time, we also know but the most successful fundraising campaigns are equally driven by the data. Yes, peer-to-peer is also a numbers game. With hundreds of events, thousands of participants, and an extensive supporter base, even the smallest change in your data can have an exponential impact for the good or the bad, (laughs) meaning it is critical to have data inform your strategy, to really understand your program KPIs and build intentional strategies both to maintain and grow each one. To help us dig into this topic, I'm happy to be joined today by Mary Sorensen and Morgan Sills from the Field Resource Development Team at the National Alliance on Mental Illness, commonly known as NAMI. NAMI is the nation's largest grassroots mental health organization, a federated alliance of more than 600 state organizations and affiliates dedicated to building better lives for the millions of Americans affected by mental illness. NAMI Walks is NAMI's signature fundraising program hosted in more than 150 communities across the country. Most recently in 2023, NAMI Walks raised a record-breaking $14.7 million, welcomed over 72,000 participants, and ranked number 28 on the recently released 2023 Peer-to-Peer U.S. Top 30. Mary Sorensen serves as the Director of the Field Resource Development Team, directing strategy, planning, and implementation of NAMI's field-facing fund development programs, and Morgan Sills is the Senior Manager on the team, specifically serving as the national lead for all things NAMI Walks. So in our conversation today, Mary and Morgan will share how their team is leading the NAMI Walks program with a top-down data-driven approach, digging into data at the national level, local level, and individual participant levels to find the greatest areas of opportunity. We'll talk about how the team has created exponential growth through incremental changes, how they customized their communications and resources based on data, and how they gained buy-in from their field leaders. Oh, so critical. So let's dive right in to my chat with NAMI's Mary Sorensen and Morgan Sills. Mary Morgan, welcome to the podcast. So happy to have you. Hey, Marcy, we're happy to be here. Thank you for having us. I love it. I love it. So I know I've told people a little bit about who you are, but I I like to hear it from from each of you. So can you just first walk us through your personal, your professional journeys that what got you to your current roles at NAMI? Mary, why don't you start? Oh, I'm happy to start. Absolutely. So I've been with NAMI for just over two years now, but I have worked in peer-to-peer fundraising from the start. It's hard to say, but it's been over 17 years now. And oh I've been primarily working on walks programs for my entire career. So I've had the really unique opportunity and pleasure to kind of just grow up within the field of peer-to-peer fundraising. I uh, started immediately out of college as a local walk manager for what was back then, I'm really going to age myself here, Memory Walk, and now known as Walk to End Alzheimer's. Um, And then I went on to serve as the statewide walk director for the Alzheimer's Association, Illinois chapter. I'm based out of the Chicagoland area um, before I transitioned into a regional role at Autism Speaks for a little while and then took on this national position. So I've just been really grateful to have had the opportunity to work for just some incredible organizations, some really great missions um, and with awesome teammates and mentors along the way. So just happy to be here. And thanks for tuning in, everybody. We could probably have a whole other conversation just about how much has changed in the walk space in 17-ish years. Exactly. Um, That's another episode. What about you, Morgan? So for me, I've had the experience that many of our listeners have had today of transitioning from a volunteer to staff for a nonprofit. So 
I started out as a volunteer for Relay for Life in my local community and at the collegiate level. Um, I had a aunt who was a Reach to Recovery volunteer and a breast cancer survivor. Um, so she got our family involved in our local Relay for Life, which in a small town was the thing to do on a Friday and Saturday evening. Um, so when I went to college, I was looking for something to to do and to meet people on a very large campus coming from a very small um, high school. So joined the Relay for Life program at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, and then throughout my time there, I had really great staff partners at the American Cancer Society that started talking to me about, have you thought about what you're going to do after college? Have you thought about transitioning into a, a nonprofit role? So applications and interviews later started with the American Cancer Society and stayed there for eight years and now have been with the NAMI for almost three years. So I've served in a variety of roles from volunteer to, to walk manager to managing teams and now working at that field level or that national level to work with our field leaders. I love it. I love the college fundraising program. It's such the secret pipeline for staff. That's actually how I got my start as well in fundraising as I did um, a college program for St. Jude and then ultimately ended up going on to work for ALSAC St. Jude. So I got the chance to get to know the NAMI team and really the two of you after NAMI was recognized as Organization of the Year by the Peer-to-Peer Professional Forum in 2022. And a big part of that recognition, not only the great uh, work that your organization is doing, was that the NAMI Walks program specifically was seeing such steady, consistent growth coming out of the pandemic, both in participation, both in revenue, and Really, everything I've heard from your team is how much you credit that to your use of data. So data at the national level, at the individual market level, and even down to individual teams and fundraisers. So I'd love to just kind of unpack that with the two of you. So when you look at the national level, so the NAMI Walks program as a whole, what are the metrics that your team is paying attention to when it comes to growth? Like, how does that impact kind of your overall strategy for the NAMI Walks program? Yeah, absolutely. I can take this one. We've really prioritized letting our data guide our strategic planning for NAMI Walks and utilizing it to shape everything from our campaign creative and to guide how we're coaching our field leaders and how we encourage them to communicate with their constituents through the training and the resources that we're providing from a national level. I know you specifically asked about the the key metrics that we're kind of paying closest attention to from a national standpoint. And I'd say there's a few that have been just a larger focus for us over the last couple of seasons from both uh, leaning into our strengths and kind of coaching to our weaknesses standpoint. So really from a a SWAT perspective, Um, starting with our retention numbers. This is our, I know a lot of programs say this, it's a large area of opportunity for growth specifically for our program. Um, But we broke this down in a couple of different ways. So we had a specific focus on um, participant fundraising and earlier activation, because we know that our returning participants, they're raising six times more on average than those first year walkers and specifically walkers that are registering eight or more weeks before our event um, are raising four times more than those signing up in those final weeks before event day. So we really were focusing on not only getting our walkers back, because like you said, mental health, it's been on the forefront of the conversation since the pandemic. Um, We've seen a huge influx in walkers over the last couple of years. We saw 59% growth in 2022, and then we saw 20% growth last year. But there was a disconnect. I I said the math wasn't adding up. The math wasn't mathing. We were seeing 23,000 more participants joining our program, and all of our growth was sponsorship. Um, Our participant fundraising was just flat. So we had all of these new walkers, but we wanted to retain them and get them activated. Um, so that was one of our big focus. Um, and that data, that, I'm sorry, that data led to some really focused um, changes. We launched our seasons earlier. So we have a spring season and a fall season, and we wanted to get them activated earlier, leading to um, a larger focus on building resources and trainings on retention strategies for our field leaders And we also used a national incentive program to encourage our retention strategies for our field leaders. 
um, and getting those team captains not only registered earlier, but fundraising earlier, which before we were just trying to get them in. And now we wanted to get them activated as soon as they started. So that was a big one in terms of of retention. Um, and then we also turned our our retention attention, I guess you would say, to our, our elite fundraisers. So our, our walk stars, they raised a thousand dollars or more for our events. Um, and we didn't really have a solid plan in place for stewarding that that really VIP population of fundraisers who just two percent of our walkers are raising forty percent of our funds. So it's a small but really mighty group of of fundraisers. Um, and even a small dip in their retention can have a huge impact on fundraising numbers. Um, so we built an entire catalog of resources and for retaining them and just really drove home in our training the importance of stewarding those relationships see around. So get them in, get them activated. And um, especially for those elite fundraisers, keeping them feeling a part of the NAMI family throughout the year were, were big strategies um, in terms of retention. I think that I think that's so smart looking at both groups, right? I think so often we focus only on the top fundraisers. Um, and I, I, for one, and, and working in national programs have certainly coached that and said, don't worry about, you know, don't worry about the people that didn't raise any money. Don't worry about if they come back or not, right? Um, and only focus your attention on the other group. But I think it's important to remember just, it might take people a little bit longer to understand their role in fundraising for the event. So if we write somebody off just because they did not fundraise the first year, you know, we even think about, I was just having this conversation the other day about staff, right? And is it realistic to expect, you know, a complete return on investment from your staff after one year of hiring when there's the relationship building, there's the learning curve? No, I would always say no, but I don't think we ever translated that to participants, right? It's the same thing. There's a learning curve. They might sign up and no, they didn't fundraise the first year. That doesn't mean they won't fundraise the next year if Mm -hmm. we give them the right tools, the right level of attention. Um, So yeah, I just think that it's smart that you're not kind of forsaking one group, which I think sometimes that's that's the conversation is, oh, we don't worry about this group over here. there can be a strategy for both. Yeah, I can Absolutely. hear my past managers and mentors going, but they're low hanging fruit. They registered for a reason. You know, maybe they were really connected to a diagnosis or the cause at that time. So they registered, they wanted to learn more, you know, something major had just happened in their life. But now that they, they've they had that diagnosis or that journey for a year, they're ready to start being more public about it and fundraise and share their story. So I know it's cliche to say they're low hanging fruit, but I can hear my my managers and mentors saying, but they are, they they register for a reason, figure out that reason and figure out how to coach them and bring them into to the calls. Reminding them of their why is so, mm-hmm. so important. Exactly, exactly. Beyond the national level, so a huge part of your job is supporting the local markets, your field leaders, um, in achieving their goals, right? Like your success, their success is your success is what I always used to say. Um, And I know y'all are talking about a ton of tools, um, scorecards, SWATs, markets of opportunity. And I know we are on a podcast, which makes it a little hard with, I know a lot of these are visuals, but can you walk us through kind of this approach to how you're helping each individual market create that data-based strategy for their event? Like, how do you get your field leaders to buy in to the numbers and buy into your plan? Mary, why don't you kind of start with that approach? Absolutely. I love the the way you described it sounded like a a data utility tool belt, like a superhero tool belt. So it, it really is. We have a lot of tools at our disposal. And what it really came down to was that diving into spreadsheets, interpreting data, some people love it and really understand it. And for some people, it's a learning curve. Um, And so we wanted to create an easier way to digest our numbers so that our field field leaders could could take that information and, and get it into the hands of their walkers. So this was, it was a brand new approach for us. This is a really different way of coaching. We were building all this stuff from scratch. So we were like, 
let's do a pilot in the 2023 season. Let's test this out, see if it works. Um, and we started what we called our Markets of Opportunity program. We lovingly called it our Moo program. It came with so many fun cow puns and Moo puns. And we even had a mascot that we named Moana. So we really kind of leaned into it, created these peer networks and, and just kind of had some fun with it. Because when you're talking about spreadsheets with numbers and little boxes, you got to have a little bit of fun. But yeah, we built these scorecards for each event. And then we tailored the plans with each walk manager to kind of lean into their unique strengths, what were their numbers saying. And then we looked at where they also had growth opportunities. We tried to keep it really positive. Um, we invited 12 events into this pilot season. We did eight from our spring and four from our fall season. And if we we chose markets that had really great growth potential, but also where we saw something in the walk manager as well. We really wanted people that were going to embrace the program, that were going to follow best practices, but also test out some new ones. We were going to try some new things. Um, and we just kind of asked them to trust in that process along the way. And I'm going to ask Morgan to dive more into that in just a bit. But um, we just wanted them to look beyond revenue and participation numbers. We really wanted to get into the heart of peer-to-peer -peer fundraising. And that was looking at those key metric engagement to help shine a light on were we being effective in our communication. So we gave these to, again, those 12 events plus our top 10. So it was about 22 of our 129. So we got a pretty good representation of, of last year's. And it, it didn't take anything special. It was our, our reporting from Donor Drive, our event insights. It wasn't anything that we had to pull um, that was complicated. It was all the stuff that was kind of at our disposal. But it took that national strategy that we discussed and it just kind of trickled it down into the field in a tangible way to kind of connect those dots. Um, each walk, uh, we went through the results and they were just kind of broken down into those metric engagements. So the basics like retention and um, uh, how much of their event was sponsorship versus uh, fundraise dollars. Because sometimes those ratios are are really off, off the national averages. It looked at um, did they customize their page, send emails through their participant center? Did Were they communicating about the um, Facebook fundraising being such an effective way to fundraise and so on? So it just kind of takes all these engagement opportunities and it gives an overview of what's working really well and what might need some attention. I say that the numbers don't lie. Um, they're going to tell us if um, we're, we're meeting our walkers where they are and if we're communicating with them about the tools and the resources that they have at their disposal and, and what they can use to be effective in telling their stories and whatnot. So where do we need to tweak communication plans? Where do we need to target specific audiences? It really paints the picture of how their event is comparing to what we're seeing on the national level um, and then coaches them through that. So um, we worked with each pilot to kind of create that priority and action plan. Um, and then we tried to make it as scalable as possible and to get that buy-in because we are our, our NAMI leaders wear many hats. And Morgan, do you want to kind of touch on how we kind of broke that down for them and kind of got that buy-in? Yeah. Like Mary said, we really made our data tangible for our field leaders. And that was by showing them how the data can turn into action and really formulate your strategic plan for the year. And that action can turn into dollars for your nonprofit, for your fundraising event. And we really did that by, we, we built our training schedule around the data and around the scorecard. So that way we could turn everything into bite-sized pieces for them in a way that everyone can understand. Like Mary said, we have some field leaders who are like, yes, data, give me all the numbers, give me all the spreadsheets. More pivot tables, the better. And then we have some that are like, just just tell me. Tell me what my data says. Tell me what I need to do and I will do it. So we really tried to take that into account when we were formulating our training schedule for the year. So one of their very first trainings that we perform at the national level is what, what are KPIs and why are they important and really breaking that down for them. Um, some people run away from the word KPI, and then some are like, yes, tell me more. Um, so we really, we took it into very bite-sized pieces for the beginners. And then by the end of the training, we're ramping it up for those individuals who are more experienced with data. So through that, we are also asking our field leaders to speak and share their best practices, share things that are working for them. 
So that way, field leaders are hearing from other field leaders. They're hearing from their peers who are right alongside them, coast to coast, in a NAMI organization, um, implementing NAMI walks into their local communities. So what are they doing? We're seeing their data going up in, you know, how many participants are sending emails through the dashboard, or we're seeing their data going up on how many participants are becoming walk stars. We're talking with those field leaders of what are you doing? We're seeing your, your numbers increase. We're seeing a positive trend in your data. Tell us what you're doing locally and how can we share that with others? And then we invite them to come on as guest speakers on to our trainings and our coaching calls to share their experiences and share what's working for them. We share resources. We, we do not reinvent the wheel at NAMI. So if someone has made something that we can share out with individuals, we do that. So we have a Walk Manager Resource Center where we put all of our resources on. We also in our weekly newsletter have a as seen in the field section. So that way we can highlight something that we've seen locally in the field that our field leaders are doing um, that others can implement. So we make sure that they're easy to implement. Um, they are able to be manipulated and, and have things minorly changed to make them successful for their market. So we share the resource, we share the voicemails, we share the Canva templates, whatever it may be that a field leader is sharing with us, we are sharing with everyone. Um, And then we really want to lean into sharing those results. So results are not always positive. So sometimes those results may be, we tried this and it did not work. We tried this in several markets from coast to coast and it did not work. So we really do a SWOT analysis of what's working and what's not. And we have those honest conversations as a group, as a program, and as field leaders together of saying, really lean into this. These things seem to be going very well. And we tried these and, and they're not working. And here may be some reasons why and some things that you can do differently if you implement this in your local community. I think what I love about this and what I love about the data is it puts um, it puts the program success, it feels a sense of control for the field mm-hmm. leaders. Because I think, unfortunately, too often I've seen people where it feels like they're crossing their fingers and hoping they hit their goal, right? Instead of saying, whether it's weekly recruitment numbers of what did you literally do every single week and what worked and what didn't work, or you thought you had done a really great job with fundraiser activation, but you didn't quite move the needle. Or, you know, here's a huge opportunity to coach just on these two talking points. Um, Or where are your people even coming from? And where are your teams coming from? Mm -hmm. And sometimes people look at the makeup of uh, their events afterward and go, that's not even what I, I realized or I intended to happen. So it then puts that control and then they can feel like, okay, if I can move these three needles, right? Move the needle on these three things. Here's what the impact will be. And it, I've seen that light bulb and that excitement with people where they're like, oh, okay. So growing my walk by 10% does not feel so scary now that I look at these numbers. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That's why I'm marrying the weekly report with the priority and action plan. So those those key metric areas where you're you're trying to grow works so well because you can see the numbers in real time and you can have the most beautiful laid out plans for your season. And we all know that it has to get reactionary from time to time as we're seeing the numbers come through. Um, But it it allows you to focus on, okay, I'm focusing on sponsorship. These are the three actions I'm going to take, you know, this week to really focus on hitting that, that goal that I'm setting out for myself. It, it makes it, tangible in a way that Mm -hmm. if you're just like, I'm going to grow by 20%, well, that's hard to point to in in that way. So this kind of breaks it down into small actions leading to those those big changes. And it's a long campaign. So it can feel like early in the early days, it feels like you're not seeing success. You're like, oh, two people signed up today. Woohoo. When you know that later on, you're going to be getting you know, 100 people a day, but it's like creating those kind of like micro metrics along the way that you can say, if you're tracking to this, like if you stay, you know, always say it's like pushing a snowball down a hill. Like the bigger it gets early on, the earlier you start, like the bigger it's going to be by the end. Yeah, we we actually added benchmarks to our timeline for the first time last year um, because we really were focused on that data. We wanted to show them that, you know, based on our numbers, based on the events that are meeting their goals, 
this is where you need to be by the end of January. You just have to have 10% of your, your teams register. That's all you need by January 31st if you're a May event. So we really, we tried to show them that it was those micro pieces of data that would get you to where you needed to be in the end and how all those puzzle pieces fit together. Especially with launching earlier, we needed some yes. buy-in on we're yeah. starting a few months earlier than normal. It's okay to start that retention effort. It's okay to start earlier. Um, and so the the benchmarking kind of helped with that conversation as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's I think that's really great. I can remember a time working on an event where everybody would say, but we're ahead year over year. I'm like, but you're one person ahead and you need to be like... 65 people ahead or whatever that looks like. So that's why I love the idea of benchmarks because it gives, you know, and it's also proportional to the size of your mm-hmm. event, right? Absolutely. So, so let's get, so beyond the event, you know, the national level, the local event level, we also talk about those individual participant and fundraising data. And it can be really overwhelming when we think about all the steps that we tell our fundraisers to take, right? We talk a lot in our language about sharing your story and posting on Facebook and updating your participant center. There's so many of those metrics that can impact your performance. Um, how are you coaching your staff on how to coach the participants, you know, training the trainer? Like how... Do you customize communications? Do you customize resources so that there's that trickle down to kind of meeting the actual individual fundraisers where they are? Yeah. Um, So for us, you know, we've talked about really making our data tangible for them, but then really making it turnkey for our field leaders. Our field leaders are wearing so many hats at a federated nonprofit organization. You know, they may be the executive director. They may be running their helpline. They may be the walk manager. And they may be, you know, answering the phones for everyone that is calling to to seek help for their their local NAMI organization. So we also provide reporting templates in donor drive. So that way our field leaders can go in. Everything is at their fingertips. So they can pull these report templates from donor drive that are focused around those, those great eight metrics. So it's able to be pulled for them to see, has my participant connected to Facebook fundraising? Has my participant customize their fundraising page? Has my participant sent emails through the participant dashboard? So they are able to see in real time and even set up a recurring report template to be sent to them automatically if they would like in real time what their participants are doing and what metrics they are achieving. So from there, we have built out a suite of resources around those eight key metrics. So we have given them plug and play email templates. We have given them a participant and team coaching plan. So it goes in and it lays out when you should be making phone calls, when you should be sending emails. We also give them a tracker because we all know that we may not remember that we called Marcy in January to welcome her to the event. So we've got a tracker we can go in and and put that information down and they can keep track of, I talked to Marcy in January, I talked to her in February, I need to communicate with her in some way in March. Um, So they can go to that participant and team coaching plan and they can see, okay, here's an email that I could send or here it is. You know, I see that this participant has not sent emails through the dashboard yet. So I'm going to go and pull resources to encourage them and show them how to use the participant dashboard to send emails to their friends and family to invite them to, to walk with them or to donate to their fundraising efforts. So we really try to make everything as turnkey and as plug as play as possible. And then from there, you know, I talked briefly about us building our training schedule around those data metrics. So we make sure that we're talking about them in our our monthly calls. We talk about them in our weekly coaching calls where field leaders can come on and ask questions. We talk about it in their one-on-ones when we're meeting with field leaders individually. We also make sure that it is in our weekly newsletter. So we're talking about data, we're sharing resources. We're giving ideas of how you can utilize those resources in your local community and really encouraging them to to react to their data and try new things um, throughout the year. I like that you are kind of matching the resources with the reports, because I think so often Mm -hmm. what I've experienced is people that would say, I know I need to call this person but I don't really know what to talk to them about, you know, or God, if I could just know the first two sentences, I should say. And Mm -hmm. I think that's, you know, you don't want it to be a crutch, but I do think 
you, what you don't want is for somebody to not take the action as a coach to do what we want them to do just because they feel like, okay, I know I need to call Mary because she's a team captain that signed up two weeks ago and she hasn't recruited any team members yet. But I don't always know what to say when I call mm-hmm. her and I get nervous. And so eh, maybe I'll just leave a voicemail and tell her, you know, let me know if you need help instead of actually calling with an action plan or with true, like, here's three things you can do today to get started and offering that help. So I know I've been in situations too where you you're told, Participants who send emails raise more money. That's great. How do I get them to send more emails? What do I need to say to them? What do I need to send to them? How do I need to communicate with them? Like I said, just anything that we can do to to help our field leaders achieve their goals and have all of those resources at their fingertips, we we implement throughout the year. Yeah, absolutely. Do they do they know how to send an email to their participant center? Do they know how to activate? You know, in in their with the tools and resources, all of that comes back to, you know, their effectiveness and being able to share their story, get their, get their communications out and tell people why this mission is important to them. I know you mentioned early on that kind of this whole data driven approach is, is relatively new for the NAMI team. So if somebody is sitting here listening today, thinking, yeah, we're not doing this and we need to be doing this. You know, we need to take a more data-driven approach with our individual markets or with our staff. What? Where would you encourage them to start? Mary, what do you think? Yeah, um, I'm thinking that the, the first one that comes to mind, uh, mind is what's your retention number? You know, are you are you getting your walkers back year over year? It's usually a pretty easy one to kind of track, but are you stewarding that relationship from you know, registration to, to finish line and, and year round. Um, so keeping keeping track on retention, I think, would be a big one for me. And then are they telling their story? Are they customizing their participant page? Are they engaging with their network in a way that is explaining why they're participating? Um, whether that's creating a, a Facebook fundraiser, if you have that activated, whether it's sharing their story and, and their why on their participant center. I think that would be another big one because that that's that communication piece. Are we are we sharing what's important to to our walkers to get them activated? Um, zero dollar walkers. To me, that comes down to to coaching. Is if your zero dollar walker is really out balanced with the the national or, or industry average, are are those welcome calls happening? Have you introduced yourself? If you're a new walk manager, are you kind of using that as your your golden ticket to say hello to everybody and introduce yourself um, and whatnot. But I would say those would be like the three that I'd look at first, as well as my ratio to sponsorship and uh, team and fundraising dollars. Are you setting that team goal high enough to have enough people to raise the funds that that you want to hit? So I think I, I upped that to four, but those would be yeah. those would be my big ones. No, those are some good ones. Morgan, what would you add? Yeah, so for me, a slightly different approach than than what Mary shared, but thinking about depending on your layer in the organization, whether you're a local walk manager, you're leading a team or you're sitting on the national team is really seeing what resources are available to you to analyze your data, um, to create that plan and figure out which are those key metrics that you need to, to tackle for your event and focus on. You know, if you're at the national level, talking to the provider of your website, what data is already being pulled? What can they help you analyze? Donor Drive goes in and, and helps us make the scorecards for all of our events and, and helps us analyze that data and sees our national averages compared to their local event averages. Um, so how can your website provider help you, you know, pull that data and see what trends are happening for your, um, for your fundraiser? And then if you're the manager of a team or, or managing a walk event or peer-to-peer fundraising event directly, what data is already, already being provided to you through your website or through your national team? And, and who do you need to ask to help you analyze that data if it's that something that you're comfortable with? So really, you know, seeing what resources are there and then starting to analyze that data and starting to ask questions. You know, no, no question is is unnecessary asking how do I analyze this data? What resources do we have in order to help me drive my retention numbers um, as an increase year over year? Or how do I help my participants customize their fundraising page? What resources do we have at our fingertips 
So really starting out with, with pulling that data and starting that, um, you know, trend of analyzing it year over year for, for your for your area and for your program. I love it. Well, I, I joked before we actually started recording that when the three of us get on the phone, we can talk about data for a really long time. Um, so I love anytime I get the chance to talk to my fellow data nerds. Um, I know people are probably really excited by hearing what you've talked about, not only about your good work, but what your organization does. So if someone is thinking, where can I learn more about NAMI, about NAMI walks? How can people get involved? Where can we send them? We'll put some links in the show notes. Where should we send people? Yeah, so we've got a few different resources. We have NAMI.org, which is our homepage for our NAMI organization. And then we have NAMIWalks.org, which is our homepage for the NAMI Walks program that links to all of our fundraising events for NAMI Walks from coast to coast. And then, of course, we are on Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and X. Awesome. Well, Mary Morgan, thank you so much. Sounds like a double name, Mary Morgan, uh, Mary and Morgan. Thank you all so much for joining us. I'm excited to see what your spring walk season brings. And we'll have, I can't wait to hear about your numbers. You'll have to keep me updated. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having us. We are always happy to share what NAMI and NAMI Walks is doing in the local community and, and always happy to show off the great work of our field leaders. Awesome. Thank you. The P2P Soapbox is produced in partnership with True Story FM, engineering by Pete Wright. Music this week is by Dan Zaitun. If your podcast app allows ratings and reviews, we hope you'll consider doing just that for our show. But the best thing you can do to support the P2P Soapbox is simply to share the show with a friend or colleague. Thank you for listening.